Hi, my dear friends. Some words of Torah for Parshat Korach. We're all familiar with the Talmudic aphorism, Kol Yisrael Arevim Zebazeh. All Israel are responsible for one another. This Arevut, or acceptance of responsibility for each other's behavior, is embedded within several verses of the Torah. An example of just how far this communal responsibility goes can be found in the story of Achan from the book of Joshua, chapter 7. When destroying the city of Jericho, Joshua declared that all the contents of the city were to be dedicated to Hashem and that no one was permitted to take any of the spoils for themselves. Scripture relates that the children of Israel violated the ban on the spoils. But in reality, only one man, Achan, secretly took some of the spoils for himself. As a result, God punished the entire nation. The next battle the army fought suffered 36 casualties as a result. When asked why this happened, Hashem responded to Joshua, Israel has sinned and violated my covenant by taking the spoils. This idea of communal responsibility seems deeply ingrained within our people. That is why it is so strange to encounter a passage where the leaders of Israel imply the opposite. After Korach gathered a group of 250 men with censer pans to rebel against the leadership, Hashem told Moshe and Aharon that they should separate from the people so that God might destroy them. Moshe and Aharon fell on their faces and beseeched Hashem to change his mind, saying, Kel Elokei Haruchot Lechol Basar, Lord, the God who knows thoughts of all flesh, Ha'ish Echad Yechata, Shall one man sin, and you become wrathful against the whole congregation? How do we make sense of this challenge lodged by Moshe and Aaron? After all, God was only proposing that which was already made known, that in Judaism we are responsible for each other. If Korach and his men were sinning, then the rest of the community should have to bear some level of responsibility. Why were they arguing to the contrary? What's even more astonishing is a Midrash which discusses this idea of Arevut. The Midrash quotes our verse, Shall one man sin? But instead of reading it as a rhetorical question, the Midrash reads it as a statement of fact. When one man sins, you Hashem become wrathful against the whole congregation. It then offers a parable to demonstrate the point. A group of people are all sitting in a boat. One man pulls out a drill and starts drilling a hole beneath him. His friends say, what are you doing? He responds, what do you care? I'm just drilling beneath my own seat. They justifiably respond that by drilling a hole underneath his seat, he will sink the entire boat. How can the Midrash take a verse which argues against communal responsibility and use it to support that very value? I asked my two teenage sons if they could help me answer this question. I pose the following to them. Let's say one of your classmates in yeshiva commits some kind of infraction. Under what circumstances would you feel it fair for the entire yeshiva to be punished for that action? And under what circumstances would you feel that the sole perpetrator should be singled out for retribution? They answered that it depended on the type of crime committed. If the young man did something that was so out of character from the rest of the yeshiva, the yeshiva had done nothing to contribute to this person's behavior, and the person's behavior is not representative of the yeshiva, then it was not fair to punish the rest of the yeshiva bachrim. But if, so if, for example, the boy was caught in a nightclub in Tel Aviv, dressed in a t-shirt and shorts, this would not be a case of ruining the yeshiva's reputation, and the young man should be expelled and the rest of the yeshiva left alone. But if the young man's behavior is in some way reflective of a certain character flaw that may exist within others in the yeshiva, and if the person's actions is a stain on the entire yeshiva, it would be fair for everyone in the yeshiva to bear some level of responsibility. Let's say, for example, the young man instead went to Ben Yehuda Street with his yeshiva garb and then started smoking, drinking, and fraternizing with girls. This flagrant and open behavior indicates that there's something amiss within the yeshiva culture, and the whole yeshiva would have to be disciplined, not just the young man in question. Their response was helpful to me in that it suggests that sometimes collective punishment is fair and sometimes it's not. In the case of Achan, 
we'd surmise that he was doing something that was on the mind of a lot of people. His action did not occur in a vacuum, and it also reflected badly on the rest of the nation. This is why collective punishment was justified in that situation. Moshe and Aaron were arguing to the God who is described in the verse as Elokei HaRuchot L'chol Basar, the God who knows man's innermost thoughts. You, Hashem, know that the Jewish people in general were never thinking about an insurrection against us. Korach is a sole bad apple who has incited others through his rhetoric and charm. His crime is not reflective of the true character of the people, and they therefore do not deserve to be punished. It would seem to me there's one more distinction to be made in our story. In other cases where collective punishment is doled out against the people, the leaders were not warned in advance about God's plan. However, in this case, Hashem notified Moshe and Aaron that he was about to destroy the entire congregation. This was a subtle cue to Moshe and Aaron that they were meant to intercede on behalf of the people. And the same can be said of other episodes in the Torah where God tells Moshe that he's about to destroy the people, as in the case of the sin of the golden calf and in the case of the sin of the spies. This seems to indicate that during this incipient stage of learning about what it means to be a Jew, Hashem was patient with the Jewish people and was willing to extend them an allowance of making mistakes that could be atoned by the proper corrective actions. Hashem was implying to Moshe, in reality, the entire congregation does deserve to be punished because of Korach's behavior. But this is still a foreign concept to this first generation of Jews. Let them know what they deserve so that in the future, if one of them sins, they should know that they will all have to bear responsibility moving forward. In this sense, Moshe and Aaron's words were both a rhetorical question and a statement of fact. For this first innocent generation of early Jews, it was meant rhetorically. They weren't yet versed in the ways of God and communal responsibility, and so it wasn't fair to collectively punish them. But it was a statement of fact for future generations who would be more aware of the Torah's teachings, as well as feel a natural sense of kinship with the rest of their countrymen. This explains how the Medrash could turn Moshe and Aaron's rhetorical question, shall one man sin and you become wrathful against the whole congregation, into an affirmative statement. I raise the issue of communal responsibility in light of our, thank God, successful reconstitution as a kehila and the shul filling up once again. Last Shabbat, we had a beautiful unity Shabbat where most of our minyanim daven together. Understandably, there was a bit more noise in the main shul than what we were used to experiencing, especially after two plus years of an emptier sanctuary and people wearing masks. Speaking in shul was the last thing that people had on their minds. This past Shabbos, a guest rabbi gave a shir on Shabbat afternoon, in which he said many nice things about our shul, but also mentioned that when we eliminate talking in shul, we will have achieved our true potential. I winced when hearing his words. He was right, and his words stung. At the same time, I recognize that we're back to that state of normalcy, just like that first generation of Jews in the desert. We are at the early stages of our return to normalcy, and we can't fault people for wanting to socialize with friends they haven't seen in a very long time. With all that said, while it's true that a minority of people can spoil the decorum, it's really up to the rest of us to make things right. As we continue moving forward, let's be mindful of how we can maintain the holiness and decorum of our mikdash ma'at, our microcosmic temple. All you have to do is step outside or just simply not participate in a conversation. That will immediately restore the holiness to our sanctuary. And so, dear friends, may we continue to, to uh, on this holy journey together as a community until we return to the Holy Land together and greet the redemption. May we see it bimheira, biyamenu, amen. Here's wishing you a beautiful Shabbos. Shabbat shalom, dear friends.